，在一八四八年，美国发现金矿。In those times, people in Guangdong Province called the American state of California "Gold Mountain," and to many, the name represented a beautiful dream. This thing, ah, for the time in the Death Valley, the growth of the Great Plains, 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 啊，为什么要出路呢？就总觉得你一定要走出去，才能够有生路。否则的话，你的家里呢，守那几亩地，你肯定是死路一条。所以呢，美国发现黄金，对我们开平的这些穷人来讲，是一个非常大的吸引力。而且他们也很需要我们这个劳动力到那去挖金。Many of the impoverished farmers borrowed money so they could embark on the long journey across the ocean in search of their dreams in Gold Mountain, California. The route taken by Kaiping people to the United States involved taking small boats to Hong Kong and then transferring to three masted sailboats, which then sailed from there all the way to California. The journey from Hong Kong to California covered a distance of around 7,000 nautical miles, and it was a journey that involved enduring many hardships. Situ Meitang was a native of Kaiping who became a famous compatriot overseas Chinese leader in the U.S. In an article under the title 70 Years Living in the U.S. as an Immigrant, published in December of 1950, he wrote, Chinese began to go to the U.S. around 100 years ago in 1848. I heard from older overseas Chinese that they came in sailboats and that the journey could take three or four months or even half a year depending on the weather. The Chinese brought their own food, but over time maggots grew in it. And by the time they landed, their beards had grown to several inches long, their eyes were sunken, and their skin was dark. Many of them couldn't stand the mountainous waves on the open sea, and embraced the masts and cried all the way from Hong Kong to San Francisco. By the time they came safely ashore, they felt they had traveled through the netherworld. After a trying journey on the ocean lasting 30 to 60 days, they finally arrived in the United States and there began to seek the fortune they had been dreaming of. In the wild mountains of the as yet relatively untamed American West, they toiled every day and while some of them were indeed lucky enough to find gold, most of them remained poor. Zhang Guoxiong learned from the Jiangmen Museum of Overseas Chinese that after arriving in the United States, many immigrants from Kaiping not only worked in gold mines, but worked as laborers building railways as well. When the American government decided in the early 1860s to build a transcontinental railway, the project was contracted out to two railway construction companies. Central Pacific was to build the western section, while Union Pacific was to build the eastern section. As the eastern part of the United States is comprised mainly of flat plains, Construction on this section proceeded smoothly, but the western section was a different matter as it involved cutting through the Rocky Mountains. Most of the workers hired in the beginning simply couldn't stand the hardships in what was still the Wild West, and work proceeded very slowly. In fact, in two years, only 50 miles of track was laid. At the time, there were already some 50,000 Chinese immigrants in California, including, of course, many from Kaiping, and the vast majority of them were young. Well, someone came up with the idea of using all these Chinese workers to build the railway, but other people expressed reservations. They doubted whether the Chinese workers would have the expertise and physical strength for the job. What finally swayed the company and the Chinese workers' favor was the reputation for efficiency and diligence earned by the Chinese gold miners. 
When the Central Pacific Railway Company decided to hire 50 Chinese on a trial basis in February 1865, no one in the company expected they would work as hard as they did. In the end, not only did the railway company decide to hire a large number of Chinese immigrants, they even appealed to the American immigration authorities to adopt more favorable criteria for Chinese immigrants. In 1868, the Chinese imperial government and the United States signed the Birmingham Treaty, Article 5 of which was designed to encourage Chinese to immigrate to the United States. Before that time, there had been strict laws in China that forbade Chinese moving abroad. The American Railway Company requested that the American Shipping Company cut the ticket price for Chinese workers wishing to make their way to the United States and at the same time sent representatives to Guangdong province to recruit workers. According to statistics, between 1840 and 1876, nearly 100,000 Chinese from the four counties of Kaiping, Taishan, Xinhui, and Enping in Guangdong province went to work in the United States. In the middle of the 19th century, gold was also discovered in Australia and Canada, and these countries too had started building railways. When they heard that laborers were needed there as well, Many people in Kaiping County went to Australia and Canada. On May the 10th, 1869, Pacific Railway laid the last railway sleeper, and with the completion of the Continental Railway, most of the Chinese workers were laid off. Some of them settled in small towns along the railway, while others took the train to find jobs elsewhere. It was from this time on that Chinese began to be seen in many U.S. cities. Some ran stores, restaurants and laundries, while others were engaged in various service businesses. Yet others reclaimed land to grow crops or become fishermen. But if we conclude that the needs of overseas labor markets and the human instinct for survival were the external forces that led Chinese from Guangdong province to seek wealth in foreign countries, what was the internal force? By the middle of the 19th century, the population in Kaiping was growing rapidly and the arable land was no longer producing grain as well as it had in the past. To make matters worse, most of the land was owned by a few major landlords, making it difficult for common farmers to survive. After the farmers had paid rent to the landlords, along with the many exorbitant taxes and levies due to the government, they had little grain left for themselves. The result was that they had nothing to live on but thin porridge. Unfortunately, the Si'i region was also prone to natural disasters. Typhoons and floods struck the region every year without fail, each time making the life of the struggling farmers even more unbearable. These factors all combined to encourage local farmers to consider going abroad for work. In 1854, 100,000 poverty-stricken farmers in the Si'i region took up arms to join the Taiping Revolution, or the Revolution of the Heavenly Kingdom. When the uprising was inevitably suppressed by the Imperial Army, many farmers who had been involved fled in boats to foreign countries. But even after the armed uprising was crushed, many farmers continued to fight over the farmland at the juncture of the three counties of Taishan, Kaiping and Enping for a further 12 years. The result, however, was terror, and many of the local inhabitants, finding themselves unable to bear the situation any longer, 
began to flee to overseas destinations. After many years of hard work, some of the Chinese who had emigrated from the Sui region gradually gained a foothold in foreign countries and began to send money to their relatives back home. According to statistics, in the 85 years from 1864 to 1949, the amount of money overseas Chinese sent back home came to a total of 3.51 billion US dollars, an average of 42 million dollars each year. Overseas Chinese sent ever larger sums of money to their relatives in their native villages, and many returned to buy farmland and build large houses. Those villagers who bought land and built houses with the money their overseas relatives sent back were naturally greatly admired and envied by other villagers. Many young women specifically wanted to marry men who had gone abroad to work, and it was the wish of many parents that they do so. Questions of age difference or whether there was even any love between the couple or not were unimportant. In reality, many men had no choice but to go abroad so they could simply earn enough money for food and clothing. And their strongest desire, having earned some money, was to return home, buy some farmland, build a house and get married. Purchasing land, having a house, build and getting married, it all sounds perfectly practical. In fact, it all reveals an attitude that is very traditional in China and is very much associated with people who came originally from the Siyi region. By tradition, Chinese people have always felt a strong attachment to their native land and their family and their clan. No matter how far they may travel, the Chinese never forget the place where they were born. And thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers. By the way, if you'd like to find out more about us and our programs, you can check out our website at www.cctv.com slash program slash New Frontiers. I'm Ji Xiaojun on CCTV International. Bye for now.